Hi everyone, it's Lauren. I hope you're all doing really well. Today I'm going to be talking through the books that I read last month across the month of July. As always, everything that I mention in this video will be linked in the description box below if you would like to look into any of these books yourself. Um, I read five books last month, which for me is actually quite good, and I felt like I really got into my stride with reading, and I think one of the main reasons for that is that I've started to get into audiobooks, which I've never really listened to before unless it's been non-fiction, but there are a couple of non-fiction books recently that I really wanted to pick up. So downloading those on Audible was actually really useful and helpful, and I've been listening to them on my commute, listening to them when I go for a run, and I quite like this system of like listening to something at the same time as reading other books. So I think I'm going to use it going forward. So the book that I listened to this month was Natives by Akala, and this was recommended to me that I listen to it because Akala reads it himself, and he is a writer, teacher, a musician, rapper, a little bit of everything, social commentator, um, I suppose. Um, and this book is all about race, class, colonialism, and that kind of structure in Britain today. What this book does really well is it mixes a lot of facts and research with Akala's own autobiography, essentially. He talks a lot about growing up as a mixed race boy um, in the 80s in London, and about sort of the trials that he faced growing up, and then uses those experiences as a springboard to talk about some wider issues in terms of Britain's colonial history, what we learn about our own history at school, which is very, very different to perhaps what the actual situation was, and about Britain's general uncomfortable relationship with race. But more closely and almost more poignantly, it's about Britain's relationship with class and how those things intersect. There's so many different things that he talks about which are extremely interesting. Um, he talks about Britain's role in the slave trade, um, he talks about our role in, just colonially in general um, across the world and all the different things that, that we've done. Um, I loved how he talked about the wider kind of pan-African diaspora, like what it's like growing up black in the UK, and um, depending on where you're, if, whether your parents are from like Jamaica and the West Indies or if they were from West Africa, um, what it's like to be that first, second generation um, immigrant in the UK and then how that experience is different to kind of black African-American communities. There are so many different topics that he touches on, like it's really really impressive how much he gets down into this book um, and it's also it, it's just so interesting that it has that personal touch and he's reflecting back on his own experiences but also giving us like extremely w well researched his history and facts and figures um, about the, our society at the moment, so I would really highly recommend this. There are some similarities in Natives to what Rennie Edda Lodge does in her book Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. So if you liked that, I think you would really enjoy Natives. However, it's not like there's no overlap necessarily. It's not like it's the same book. Um, they're definitely looking at things in at different perspectives. They're looking at slightly different issues. Um, so it's well worth a read, really, if you want to kind of understand some aspects of why we are where we are today. I also read a little bit of fantasy this month and the first book that I picked up was Alphabet of Thought by Patricia A. McKillip and this was lovely because it was a standalone fantasy book um, which I don't think I've ever read. I mean it's not very long either and she manages to kind of paint a huge massive world um, very very quickly. I mean at some point at some points I did find it a little bit hard to follow, perhaps it could have done with a little bit more explanation, but I really enjoyed that actually, how she just threw you in there and got on with the story. This is about a foundling called Nepenthe who's been brought up in a library and she's been brought up to be um, a translator essentially, translating weird and wonderful alphabets. And then the wizards at the wizard school have um, been given this crazy book which they can't translate um, because its alphabet is all thorny, but it turns out that Nepenthe can translate it. So they give it to her and we've got a bit of dual, maybe two or three stories happening at the same time where you have Nepenthe falling in love with this like wizard student, um, you have her translating the book so we're working out what's happening in the history of this story. And there's also a young 14 year old girl who has just unexpectedly become queen after her father's died and so there's all the, what's happening in court as well with her being unprepared to be queen. Um, and it's just, it's just really nice. It, like I say, there were some bits which I found a little bit di difficult to follow. I think she throws you in really, really quickly. Um, but I just really enjoyed the story. It was a little bit different, and I would, I would definitely be interested in reading some more by her now. Next, I picked up *Women in Power* by Mary Beard, um, which is very, very short. This is actually even shorter than I expected it to be. Um, this is essentially two lectures that Mary Beard gave about women 
in power, funnily enough. But it doesn't really feel like two lectures because she has a prologue, it does read all the way through and she also has a little epilogue where she explains, you know, what what was going on in the world at the time when she did the lectures as opposed to as the t at the time when she published it because, you know, she talks about Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and what happened in that election and things like that. So she kind of then gives herself some perspective at the end of the, at the end of the book. But generally, this is an examination of how we as a society tend to react to women who are in powerful positions um, and this notion that we have that women must be silent. She uses a lot of examples from um, the classical world um, where where women basically didn't have much voice um, but then she brings that into, she shows some very modern examples as well. As I said she talks about um, the US election, um, also about how she finds being a very outspoken vocal woman on Twitter. And I don't have that much more to say on it actually because it is just very short and she gives lots of different examples and at the end you just kind of go, hmm, interesting Mary, interesting. Um, it's not sort of a stance I've never heard before but she does write and speak very well, very eloquently um, and you know it is just very interesting when she takes examples back even further than we normally do. I think we're very um, we're, we're very used to looking at things like what it was like for women in the 50s, for example, as opposed to now. But she's like, you know, showing a through line way, way, way back um, in history and showing how we, we, we still haven't moved on as much as we really should have. Then I read A Den of Wolves by Juliette Marillier, which is the third book in her Blackthorn and Grimm series, which I've been reading with Jean and Jill. And this was really, really good. I really enjoyed reading this. I wasn't sure about it because the second book in the series, Tower of Thorns, I think, I thought I didn't enjoy that much. But Den of Wolves, I feel like we're back, in, we're back into it. I thought it was a really good rounding off of the series because I have heard that this series was supposed to be a much 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 longer and then uh, Juliette Marillier's publishers were like you need to like just wrap it up now we only want three books um so it's the kind of thing we don't expect it to end after three books but she does make it work what I really enjoy about this series is that the characters I just feel like I really get inside them <laughs> sounds a bit weird um but I just I feel like I really know them very well I I feel like some of what she does especially with the plot um, the way she sets things up is sometimes quite heavy-handed, um, but I think this is my third book with Blackthorn and Grimm now, and I just I just love them, and you know she's really won me over. Essentially, every book is them just going to different places and solving some kind of mystery um, as part of this medieval Irish fantasy <laughs> fantasy kingdom. Um, so it's almost like a like a crime book, um, but what I enjoy is that a lot of the a lot of the characters don't necessarily know what's going on and you read from different perspectives and it's quite fun to try and work out um, what you think is going on, what you think is going to happen and that's why these books are really good to buddy read as well because um, we all had different theories. And I am really sad that it's over actually. I think we're just going to keep reading all of her books now. I think Jean has absolutely won us over and like <laughs> we're, we're just down with Juliette Marillier like this is it, this is this is my life now. Just read all everything she's ever written. Um, but yeah, I, I would recommend this series actually. And finally I read Beloved by Toni Morrison which I have been wanting to read for a really really long time and I was not disappointed with the quality of the writing and um, this is quite a difficult book to read um, but I do think it's really worth it. This is the story of Setha who is an, an ex-slave who is living in a house with her mother-in-law and her daughter but she's also being haunted by the ghost of her baby daughter um, who died I think 10, 18 years ago and um, so we jump in time a lot uh, during this book and we see lots of different perspectives because also um, Paul D, someone who she used to be a slave with, turns up at her door and then we get a little bit of his history. We kind of jump to the point when they were all slaves um, back on the plantation called Sweet Home and and, and then what's happening now. Um, so at points it gets quite abstract. When I read that she was being haunted by the ghost of her daughter, I think I thought, oh, she's haunted by the death of her daughter. Like, but no, really physically, like there is a full on ghost which who walks in the door. Um, so it does get quite magical realism-y. Um, but in a way that I think like really, really works. And it's interesting how she uses that kind of technique. It's, it's like a manifestation of all of the grief and all of the pain and the trauma. Um, and, and it becomes physical and it becomes real. Um, and I, I think that's that's incredible. Um, in terms of telling you, I, I can't say too much about what actually happens because it's almost just, 
an, an examination of of this woman um, and and what she did 18 years ago, which she's being haunted by, um, and and the ghost that kind of that won't let go. And I think what works really well is that we are seeing a kind of post-slave society, but also Setha, who who was a slave before she escaped, but then after she escaped, slavery that was then abolished. So you're sort of seeing that even even people that got out, even people that had never um, even necessarily never lived under slavery are still so so affected by it um, and people can't really move on and um, it, yeah it's it, it's such a it's such a beautiful book to read like her writing is is incredible and all of the stories that she that she take she takes you through all of these different people's experiences um, like it, it is just it's just awful um, but it's not so violent. I think you can get some other books where it, it feels like you can't read it because it's too gruesome and I don't think that's really what happens here. It's more like the pain is just so harrowing um, that people had to go through and as I read it it's difficult to say that I enjoyed the reading experience of it because once I got I think more than three quarters of, of the way through um, I did start feeling like okay this is just kind of more of the same it's sort of building and building and building and it, it's almost quite draining for me to read um but then you kind of feel like well that is that's the point it's like it's it's never ending and the relentlessness of this pain of the suffering just like really comes through in her writing because her writing is quite slow to read and there's a lot of detail in there um so you can't just whiz over her sentences like you have to really take your time with it um and I feel like that really comes through in the structure of the book, like the never ending, um, like never ending pain, essentially. But I did particularly like how the book looked at the differences, how slavery affected the men and the women, but then also the relationships between the mothers and daughters and sisters. And I mean, it's very, very focused on like a woman's experience, I, I would say. And through that, it gets to like really explore the extremities of love as well as, well as pain and like how, <laughs> how love can be quite violent in it in itself as well um so yeah i don't know if that was a very good review i hope i persuaded you to read it um but yeah i'm just i'm just quite like taken aback by it essentially um it's not the kind of book that you read and go oh my god i'm loving reading this let me read it more if anything i was like i don't know if i want to keep reading it um but i'm so glad i have and stepping back from it i'm like that's gonna that's gonna stay with me for a while so I would love to hear from you if you've read any of these and have a little chat in the comments about them. Let me know what you've been reading in July and what you plan to read for the rest of the rest of the August, I was gonna say, rest of the year, whatever. What are you looking forward to reading next? And I will see you in my next video. Bye.